This morning we will be in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, actually verse 9b. C.S. Lewis, who authored a book called Mere Christianity and uh, wrote some excellent uh, plays and poems and just very insightful man. Uh, the, the series Narnia have been uh, his writings uh, has been quoted by so many for so many years because his quotes are so profound at times and he literally gets them from the word of God and he kind of takes the word of God and, and, and summarizes it in, in these little quotes that, that he's quoted in so many churches around the world. And this one just struck me so, so deeply in my heart that it caused me to think about it and meditate upon it uh, for many days now. I actually posted it on my personal Facebook and, and put it as, as our profile on our, our church Facebook. And this is what he said. He said, I want God not my idea of God. I want God, not my idea of God. What does he mean by that statement? I want God and not my idea of God. I want who God says he is, what he has written in his word, and I don't want my idea of what I think God is and what I think he says in his word I want just him for who he is and what he has said. Recently, and it it just came out, Victoria Olstein came out and said that we are here in church, yes, to worship God and for God, and, and that's true to a sense, but she said this, we're really here for ourselves. We're really here to be happy. We're really here to let God help us to be happy because God is happy when we're happy. And if we're happy, then he's happy. And so come to church and just live your life for him and, and, you know, uh, do good and be happy and God will be happy. Now that's an idea of God and that is not God because what about the Christians who are not very happy right now because their children are being beheaded for the gospel's sake what about the parents that are being killed in front of their children not not a happy situation uh, maybe an anger situation maybe a sorrowful a terrifying horrific not happy but do you think God's happy I think God is more than happy with them than us in America who are saying I'm happy because I have a new car. I'm happy because I'm able to buy clothes. I'm happy because I go on vacation. I'm just so happy. So God must be really happy. That's an idea of God. And that is not the truth. What C.S. Lewis was saying is, I want God and that's all I want. I don't want to add to him. I don't want to surmise what I think he's saying. I want him just as he is. That's it. That's what I want. And Peter is saying that in these few verses here. And these false teachers are saying and giving us their idea of who God is. So the next few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these false prophets and false teachers. Now remember, keep the context. Peter in chapter 2 is talking about false teachers and false prophets. He's talking about these, these men that come into the church and he's warning the church, beware of these people who come in with, with their flowery words, with their lies, with their suggestions, with their ideas. And these are all ideas of God, but they're really not God. And Peter's at the end of his rope, and he's really basically saying, look, these are things that I think are important, and I think that you need to hear them and apply them to your life as young Christian men and women in the day and age that we live. And so last week, or a couple of weeks ago, when I taught, we left off with a positive note in verse 9a, where Peter says, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And that is a positive note. That's a note that we should be going, amen, hallelujah, that God is able to deliver us. God has the power and the resources to help us through our trials and our struggles in this world. He even gave us the examples Uh, of the angelic beings he gave us the examples of Noah he gave us the example of Lot and how he delivered them and so God does have the power to deliver us so that should give us hope right so don't lose hope 
Whatever you're going through, whatever trials, whatever struggles, God has the power to help you through them. Now, he may not take it away from you. You may need to learn some lessons through those trials. You may need to grow, but God will help you in that growth if you really want God to help you. See, the question really is, as C.S. Lewis said, I want God. Do we want God? Do we really want God? Why are we here in church? Why do we come to church? Is it to be happy? Do you think coming to church makes you happy? I think it does to a certain sense, but that's not the reason to coming to church. It's not the reason at all. Well, is it to put in our time so that we we are giving God at least a little bit of our time, but then living the rest of the week the way we want to live? What's the purpose of coming to church? Paul was very clear in Ephesians that the pastors were to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so one aspect is is that the pastor is equipping the saints for the work. For what work? Well, whatever God's calling you to do. For whatever God has for your life, whatever plan it is, we're here to help you fulfill that plan, in a sense. Uh, We're your teachers, you know? And, And in a sense, we're guiding you through the scriptures as you live out your Christianity in this world. The other aspect is we're here for God. You're not here for the leadership. You're not here for your neighbor, your husband, your wife, you know, uh, your moms, your parents. You're not here for them. You're here for God. You're here to worship God. You're here to display your affection to God in worship. I really appreciate the fact that all of you today were here on time. You were actually early, some of you. Uh, I walked in about 15 minutes before uh, we were even going to start, and there were several people here already. I'm thinking, yes. That's the way it should be because that displays our heart that we really want to come and worship God because this is his time with us uh, where we give to him our hearts and we praise and sing about how good he is to us. And he is good. He is good because he gives us breath. He gives us life and he provides for us. And so we're here for him to worship him, to focus on him and then to hear from him. Because many of you may have some questions. Many of you may have some doubts. And God wants to minister to you. And I find that sometimes as the teaching is, is being given, that the Lord answers those questions. Uh, more than, than not, I hear people say, Wow, how did you know I was going through that? And obvious answer is I didn't. You know, I don't have a camera in your house. I'm not watching everything you do. I don't sit out in the front of your house and watching you and take notes. You know, I don't do that. It's the Holy Spirit who knows. And He knows how to minister to you. And this is one way of doing it. That's why it's so important to be in the word of God because God does the same thing with the word of God it's the word of God it's the truth and the truth will set you free and Jesus even said man shall live by what every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God not our ideas of what we think the word says it's what God has said in his word and as we read his word and we study his word he ministers to us his truth and that's how we find joy and happiness in God so in these, in these few verses, we have the unjust are fleshly and proudful. Un, the unjust or the ungodly are fleshly and proudful. What we are seeing here is a description of the ungodly, these, these false prophets, these false teachers, and yes, unbelievers who don't believe in Jesus Christ. They have not received Christ into their hearts, thus they are unbelievers, You might ask yourself, as we're studying these verses, and you may ask yourself, hey, that sounds a little bit like me there. And it might sound a little bit like you as I was reading and studying. I could see myself in some of these areas where I'm struggling with, and and rightly so. We need to see that in ourselves, and then we need to make the choice to say, okay, uh, obviously I'm not condemned. I've asked Christ into my heart as a believer now, but God wants to work these things out. He wants me to grow. He wants me to be more like Christ. And so as long as I'm not practicing these things on a daily basis, I'm fine. It's just that I need to grow in those areas. And so I need to pray, and I need to watch, and I need to resist. I need to submit myself to the truth and to God as we go through this. So so let's begin in verse 9b, the second part of of 9a, as it said, the Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation. And to reserve the unjust 
under punishment for the day of judgment. Now, the word reserve means guarding as one would a prisoner. So these false prophets and teachers, God knows how to put them under punishment for the day of judgment. And in a sense, the Greek suggests that they are being punished even today and awaiting for that day of judgment before God. And again, Peter's telling the reader that the unrighteous will be punished or they'll be pruned in a sense on the day of judgment when God separates the just from the unjust, from the just. And so when God comes back and returns, he will separate those that believe and those that do not believe, and then he will send them in the judgment. Turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. I just want you to see this real quickly. It gives us a a, a view of what will happen on that day of judgment when God will come back and what is happening today with the church and who has infiltrated the church and who sits within the church itself and they call themselves believers but they really are not believers and so jesus gives this parable to the disciples and he says in verse 24 of chapter 13 of matthew the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field but while men slept the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way and so the enemy sows tares among the wheat What he's saying here is that the church, the body of Christ, is like that man, like God, who comes and sows good seeds in people's hearts. Uh, His whole purpose is to save hearts, to save souls. But the enemy comes in and sees the work of God, and so his purpose is to destroy those souls and those seeds. And so then he sows wheat among, or, or, or tares among the wheat. He sows those bad seeds, and it comes into the church. And their motive is not for God nor a want for God, but their motive is their idea of God. Their idea of God is, what does God give me? How can I receive from God? What can I gain from that? How can I gain from others and so forth? But, in verse 26, when the grain has sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appear. So the servants of the owners came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then... Does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no. At least while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in a bundle to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. This parable really displays for us a warning that within the church, you'll have struggles. You will always have people that are in there to cause problems. So be aware of that. Know that. Don't become a part of that problem. Stay away from that stuff. Stay away from the gossip. Stay away from the terrors. Stay away from those that are here because of the wrong motives and the wrong reasons. Hang around those that have the right heart, that want to worship the Lord, that want to serve, that want to get involved. Those are the people you want to hang around with. The others, forget them. Just let them go. Eventually, they'll either fall away or find another church that will receive them. That's just the way it is. And God, in the end, will take those, bundle them up, and then he'll cast them into the fire. He'll take the rest that are wheat, and he will put them into his barn, where we'll be with him for everlasting. And this final judgment uh, on the wicked is what we call the great white throne judgment found in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, where all the ungodly of this age will be raised, judged, and cast into that lake of fire from which there will be no escape for the wicked or for the false prophets and teachers. You can turn back to verse 10 of Peter. He goes on and says, especially those who walk according to the flesh, In the lust of uncleanliness and despise authority, they are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. I like this verse. It's a good warning, a good description of these type of men, these false prophets and teachers. He says, especially those who walk. And the word walk there means their behavior, their style how they behave themselves on a regular basis. You can't get away from that, really. You know, people can put up a hypocritical face for a while, but usually their guards are let down. 
uh, they become themselves again, and then all of a sudden their true colors start coming through. And usually it, it takes about two years. Uh, I've noticed that within the, the church. It takes two years because people are coming in, they, they, they put on this face, they want everyone to like them, they, you know, and so it, it's, it's a great facade. You know. And instead of just being yourself. You know. And so within two years, you all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, this is who they are. This is who they are. That's their order of life. That is how they normally walk. That is their order, is what he's saying here. And its order is fleshly, and it's lust and uncleanliness. Now, those are two interesting words. I'm not going to spend time in those words, because those are a byproduct of the flesh. Uh, Obviously, the word lust means passionate desires, and you can go all kinds of ways with passionate desires, from sexual immorality to materialism and so forth. I mean, these are lusts that, that men will, will spend lots of money for. Lusts that, that men will do whatever it takes to gain and grab that, those things. And the uncleanliness is the defilements of that lust. The defilements, um, uh, these Isa Muslims, radicals who are taking these, these young ladies and they're literally housing them in a place and then they will, will sell them off to these lustful, un- uncleanly men who will come in and pay money uh, for these young girls. That is what Peter is talking about. That is uh, really at the heart of these false prophets and false teachers. And, and if I would have shown that video, it would have displayed it completely, this guy. That's taking place even to this day. What I do want to focus on is the word flesh. Because we all deal with the flesh, don't we? Now, we need to be careful when we define this term. Because we can define it in, in, in two ways. Like, like Jesus, who is God, he became flesh. The word became flesh, John tells us, right? So God became flesh. He became like us, flesh. He had bones. And he had ligaments and cartilage and muscles and, and then uh, fat and then skin and then hairs and all those things he became flesh that's not what peter's talking about here though he's talking about another word here the example of flesh here that he's mentioning is in contrast to that flesh within the context is talking about total depravity uh, depraved of nature itself that depraved nature that we all have that sinful nature we says it's total depraved nature. Flesh ethically refers to the part of man which, because of the fall, is opposed to God and to holiness. The depraved nature of man does not want to submit to any kind of authority. Do your own thing is this continual message, and many people follow it. That is the flesh. The flesh is our sinful heart. It's the desire and the passions of our hearts. That's the flesh that Peter is talking about here. And, and we say those things, do your own thing. How many times we've heard that? And usually it's in the world, but the church has kind of caught that a little bit, and we have that attitude. I hear so many in the church say, follow your heart. As long as you follow your heart, you're okay, right? To a certain degree, if your heart is in the Lord, and your heart is to know God and want what God wants for you, then yeah, follow your heart as long as it's following God. But if your heart is not, because the Bible says, be warned, your heart is deceitful, wicked. You don't even know it. You know, and so it can deceive you. And so I stay away from my heart and what my heart thinks. And that's why so many times people think, you're heartless. You're a heartless person. You have no heart. I get that all the time. I'm like, I know, I am. I'm a heartless person. But I'd rather follow what God's word says than my heart, than my heart. What does the word of God say? And am I following it? Then I'm okay with God. I might not be okay with you and you don't like my heart, that's fine. But I'm okay with God because I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm not going to follow my heart. I'm going to follow his word. Now, I have compassion and I have love for you, but I can't condone this adulterous affair. I'm sorry. Well, what kind of heart is that? You don't understand. I I need to be happy. You know, I I can't live in this situation. I'm tired of that situation. But that's not what God has said. Well, then you're heartless. You have no idea what I'm going through. And so I can't talk to you because you don't know. You haven't been through it. And that's usually the case because they want to follow their heart. Or take care of yourself. You know, that's the number one thing, right? Take care of yourself. Forget about everyone else. Just take care of yourself. And in fact, use other people. If it helps you and it achieves your goals of selfishness, then hey, good for you. At least you're taking care of number one, numero uno, yourself. 
That's who you should be really concerned about. Is that God's heart? No. All over scriptures, it's always talking about thinking of more of highly of others more than yourselves. Serving others. Jesus himself even said, this should settle it right here. I did not come to be served, but to serve. And then he said, and to be a ransom. And to be a ransom for all. I mean, that says it all right there. I did not come to be served. I didn't come so you could wash my feet. Let me wash your feet. I didn't come that you would cook for me. Let me cook for you. You know, He set that example. But the world has turned it around and says, no, serve yourself first. And here's the greatest uh, lie. Love yourself. Love yourself first. And, and when you love yourself, then you can love others. Is that true? That's not true. That's a lie. That's an idea of God and not what God has for us. The Bible says in Ephesians that no person has ever hated his flesh. That says that we already love ourselves. In fact, we love ourselves too much. What we need to do is love less of ourselves and sacrifice ourselves for others. When we were at the beach, um, because of these riptides, the, the, the lifeguards were were really on alert. And I think they were a little oversensitive because in July, and I don't know if you heard about this, there was a lifeguard who gave his life to save someone out there. And in 100 years, a lifeguard has not died in the action of saving another person. And so I think they're, they're really being cautious uh, and being safe, not just for the people that are swimming, but also for themselves. And that happens when something like that happens, something that big you lose a life, especially a, a fellow worker and someone that you love and a part of your, your team for so many years. And so forth. so they were very cautious over the whole situation. You know? And so uh, understandable, completely understandable, you know? totally understandable. He gave his life for others, though. That's the point. He gave his life for others. That's what Christ wants for us, to give our lives for others. Not that others would serve us. And we get this mentality that the truth and the idea of God is, is first love yourself. That's a lie. We're to first love God. Jesus said, here's, here's all the laws summed up in two. First love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? And the second one is just like it. And what is it? Love yourselves to the extreme. Is that what he said? No. He said, love your neighbors as you love yourself. Now, People will take that and say, "Uh aha, see, he said, as you love yourself. So until I love myself, no, he put neighbors first. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so as you're loving your neighbor, you'll love yourself. Paul said, and and I believe it was Timothy, it might have been Titus, where he says that if you literally go out and save someone, you save yourself. Think about that one for a bit. That's why I love serving. Because it takes my mind off of my problems. The problems I can't control. The problems that that I have no way of changing. And so I have to pray and say, God, take these. But if I'm sitting there all day long on the couch watching TV or doing nothing, I'm thinking about these problems all day long. No wonder I'm depressed. But if I'm out serving, I'm not thinking about it. I'm helping somebody, and I'm helping somebody that has a need, then I forget about those problems. And God takes care of them, and I realize, oh, wow, God took care of it. Praise the Lord. So I know that there's good in helping others, something good that happens to me. God saves me along the same road. You know, like that like that um, old story that Chuck told, you know, uh, an avalanche came, two guys were in a cabin, and it came and it just swallowed the cabin all up, and one guy was outside, and, and he was uh, in the snow, barely alive, and so this guy dug his way to him, was able to get to him, and once he got to him, says, we're going to get out of this, we're going to get out of this, I, I, I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you, and so they kept digging and digging and digging, they could finally hear voices, and finally they came out the other end, and he saved this guy because he nearly died. But see, in the process of saving this guy, he saved himself at the same time. And that's the point of serving, is that as we serve, we're saving ourselves too. And so that's important to understand. It's not all about take care of number one first, myself. Though we get that idea, and we really have to make a conscious effort not to think that way anymore. It takes a while to think the other way. 
Jesus said this to the disciples in Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. It's easier just to give in to the flesh than to work at the spirit. Romans, uh, Paul said, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. The law illuminates our sinful nature. When the law says thou shalt not murder, we realize if we've committed murder that we're sinful. Jesus said, look, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder. The law illuminates our heart and says, wow, even our hatred for someone is like killing them. We have a sinful nature, and that sinful nature, that sin that we do will lead to death, is what he's saying if we're not careful. Paul gave a list of the works of the flesh that we're talking about here, and he lists them very clearly. The works of the flesh are evidence, Galatians 5.19, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, reviries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Read that list over. Because I read that list and, and sometimes I, I, I get a little upset. I get a little angry. I'm like, okay, Lord, that's the flesh. That's the flesh. Dissensions is the flesh. Heresies, false teachings is the flesh. Ambitions, selfish ambitions is the flesh. That's a big one in church. I want a position. How can I get a position? How can I get it in leadership? Instead of just coming and serving and let God raise you up, you're looking for opportunities and who can I step over, you know, and how can I display myself in such a way that people will look at me and say, hey, I, I need that guy on my team, you know. That's selfish ambition. That's the work of the flesh. You know? These are the works of the flesh that Peter's talking about. Paul said, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so serve. Read your word. Get involved in ministry. Get involved with the Lord. And the more that you do that, you're walking in the spirit, the less of the flesh you fulfilled. You know, I, I love vacation, especially going to the beach, because I do nothing but lay on the sand and go in the water. Pretty much, I, I wake up, I prepare myself. By 9 o'clock, I'm out there. And we don't go back until 4 o'clock. You know, Virginia's about 11. <laughs> and then she's gone at 3. But I just love doing nothing and relaxing and laying there. But you know what? I miss doing this. In fact, when we came home Saturday, we got home by 11. I was here at church about, I don't know, 11, 30, 12, already working on the canopies. I'm like, oh, I need to go there and blowing and cleaning up and getting it ready for today because I love it. I love it with a passion. Now, some of you might say, oh, you've got a major problem. You can't let it go. No, I just love it. I just love it. Yeah, you're right. I got a problem. It's, it's Jesus. You know, and I like my idea of serving him better than yours if you're doing nothing. I'd rather do something than nothing for the Lord. I'd rather walk in the spirit than I'd not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, these unjust men walk in that flesh. L- listen to the next statement. And despise authority. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. So here's the idea that these men despise authority because... It goes against their idea of God. They have an idea of God, that that God wants them happy, God wants them wealthy, God wants them to prosper. And so that's their idea of God, so they will despise anything that goes against those things. And that's why Calvary Chapel is so despised by the faith doctrine, by the wealth doctrine, because we go against that. We don't give out offerings. You know, I've heard of churches that literally the pastor will be teaching and all of a sudden he's like, oh, I just, the Lord just gave me a word. Oh, hallelujah for you guys, brothers and sisters. He just told me take another offering. You're going to be blessed. Oh, boy, he has a blessing for you now. Let's get the plates. Let's pass them around right now because the Lord's going to bless you. And people are like, oh, I want to be blessed. You know, let's give them our cars. You know, let's give them the deed to our home. And it's crazy because they have an idea of God. And they want these material things. 
and they'll do whatever it takes to get it. You know, that's their idea. They identify with Christ. Oh yeah, Christ is the Lord. Christ died on the cross. Christ died for our sins. We're saved by grace. It's believing in him. But Christ is not their Lord. He is not their Savior. They're using him for their own purpose. And in reality, they don't know God. And in reality, they don't want God. They just want their idea of God. <clears throat> Maybe this example will help you. When I was about 20, 21, 22 years old, we used to hang out at my mom's house. We lived next door to her, but her place was, was nicer to hang out. We had a pool table. All the guys would hang out, have a few beers, you know, get a little drunk, start talking until all nights, all time in the night, so forth. And we would start talking about being happy. And uh, this is what I would say. I would say, I think God wants me happy. I think God wants me to provide for my family. And right now, you know, I, I have this minimum wage job and I can barely provide for my family. And so I'm really thinking of selling drugs and becoming a dealer. Because I think God would be okay with that because it's going to help my family. And I knew somebody was, that was a mule uh, for, you know, a very well-known cartel. And, and so for me to get hooked up into that would have been really easy. But my idea of God was that he wants me happy and it would be okay for me to become a dealer. This friend of mine actually um, disappeared. Uh, he became a homeless person and we never could figure out why he would do that, but I really think it was because he stopped being the mule and they wanted to kill him. And so the best way to disappear is to become a homeless person and just live on the streets. That's, that would have been my life. But the idea of God is what they live for. It's not that they want God. He says they are presumptuous and self-willed. The word presumptuous means they're bold, they're virtuous, they're reckless, they're daring. Uh, this man that I was going to show on this video, he comes right out and says, I am Jesus Christ. Very boldly, I am Jesus Christ. And he uses the word of God to his advantage. He comes out and says, there is no more sin. People don't have to worry about doing bad things because sin does not exist anymore. Like, what Bible are you reading? And then he says, but they have to tithe because the Bible says they need to tithe. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, what is it that these people don't see? It is so clear, but, but they're so, I guess, brainwashed and they're looking for something. And it's probably, again, that, that idea that, of God that they want and they see that they can get it through this individual. I can live a life of sin without it being sin, you know, and I can support the church and get richer and wealthier because God wants me rich and wealthy is what the guy says too, you know. Presumptuous. They're self-willed. The word self-willed here in the Greek says live to please themselves. That's all they live for. These men are so pleased with themselves that nothing else pleases them and they don't care to please anyone else but themselves. They stubbornly maintain their own opinions or assert their own rights, their own rights, but are reckless of the rights and feelings of others because they're so in love with themselves. They regulate their life with no respect of what others feel like. Clearly, the man who is self-willed is an unpleasant person when you really hang around him. He is intolerant, condemning, everything that he cannot stand and thinking that there is a way of doing anything except his way. They were so arrogant that they would even defy God and get what they wanted as long as they got it and were pleased. This is what Warren Risby said. He summed it up like this. The picture here is of proud people who try to build themselves up while they try to tear down everybody else. They show no respect for authority and are not afraid to act and defame people in high position. They're very aggressive. This is my opinion. There's a phrase out there. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah we know what you're saying. <laughs> you're, just, you're just saying what's on your heart, which is the evil, wicked, and deceitful. You know, but I'm just saying. Now, I like to turn that around and I'll put God's scriptures in there and I'll say, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, that's what God said. That's all. Yeah. But we use that frame. Peter then gives an example of, of respecting authorities. Now, 
there's two ways of looking at this. You might think, well, is he talking about pastors, leadership here that they're rebelling against and their authority? Yes, that could be one way. Another way is that these were angels, and that's why Peter gives the example of angels, angels' authorities, the witness of the Holy Spirit, God himself. They're rejecting all authority is what, what Peter is saying here. They have, they have, they're so self-willed, so self-governed that they don't need anyone telling them what to do because they know what to do. They've got all the answers. So whereas angels who are greater in power and might, Peter says, do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. So in other words, angels respect authority. Now we see that with Michael, the archangel, in Jude. A great example of it. When they were arguing over the body of Moses, him and Satan. And Michael just said, hey, I totally respect your authority. You know, I I understand what you're saying, but... The Lord is going to rebuke you. He didn't say, okay, put up your Duke Satan. We're going to fight right now. Wait, you're wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. And then just go get through all. No, he just says, you know what? The Lord rebukes you. That's powerful. That's a lot of weight there. When the Lord will rebuke you. And the Lord will rebuke Satan. We know that in the end. So the angels are not revilers, uh, reviled by false prophets teachers but false teachers are are not reviled by the angels they are greater in strength and power yet no better than to intrude into a sphere that is not within their authority we may recognize our authority in jesus but it's only in jesus that we have authority so we should leave the reviling accusations to him alone yeah we're in jesus and yeah we have authority but we have no right to bring accusations Uh, Paul even said that, don't bring an accusation against an elder lest there be two or three witnesses. Be careful. These men, they contemplate for a moment the audacity of, of these men who dare to do what holy angels would even dare to do. They have a right to bring these accusations against those that are in authority. Just think, of the corresponding judgment that will justifiably repay such defiance as it comes upon them. Just think, as these false teachers who are self-willed bringing accusations upon those in authority. Whether it's God himself saying, you have no authority over me. Your word has no power over me. Or whether it's the angels or whether it's those in authority. We need to be warned and not be foolish and mock what God has said to be true. We need to be careful how we live our lives and if we are self-willed men or men under authority of God. Let me close. We We need to think ourselves as sojourners. This isn't our home. This is not our place. We're just passing through this sinful world. And we're not building our homes here to last for eternity. We're just pilgrims on a journey to a far better land, heaven. And it is better to want what God wants than it is to want the idea of God. Be careful of your idea of God. I would go home and ask yourself, Lord, do I have ideas of you or do I know you? I want to just know you and what you have said in your word. Remove my emotions, remove my ideas, remove what I've heard because we're influenced by all the things that we heard, how we were grown uh, up in this world and society, you know, with backgrounds and so forth. All these things come into play. Lord, remove it all and let me just hear you through your word. Let me hear what you want and I will receive that. And then the heart and everything else will come into play, the way that you walk, the way you present yourself. The peace and the joy and the rest will all be a part of that relationship with Jesus Christ because now he is the center of your life. When Jesus began his ministry, he said in Matthew, the people who are sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadows of death, upon them a light dawned. For that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A great light has come and shined among us.